Yes, thank you and welcome everybody. It's, it's, it's always a privilege to, um, to open a conference as the Vice Chancellor of the University and particularly to welcome you here to our new Media City building. But it's a double privilege for me because I also happen to be an archaeologist. Um, <laughs> uh, and what's more, somewhat of a, well not, I wouldn't describe myself as an industrial archaeologist, but certainly an urban archaeologist, which means that I've had a good deal to do with uh, industrial archaeology uh, in my time. And I can tell you that as far as I know, this conference is pretty unique. I haven't come across um, another one like it. Um, and I'd like st straight away to uh, thank in particular uh, Nigel and uh, Mike, who have worked very hard to put this together. If, if I can in, 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 do a little bit of, uh, of one-upmanship for the University of Salford. When I knew I was coming here uh, three years ago, I spent most of my career in South Africa at the University of Cape Town, and I obviously uh, uh, moved here on account of the weather. Um, and when I, when, I, when, I, when I knew I was coming here, um, I, I noted that we didn't have an archaeology department, and we've never had an archaeology department, and that's fine, because that's what happens in my sort of line of business. You don't necessarily find uh, your, 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 your own discipline there. But it so happened that through my career, uh, that the, the greatest concentration of colleagues with whom I've co-published happened to be up the, at the road at the University of Manchester, which has a great archaeology department, and I'd you know, I've, I've known people there for years, and I'd work with them and publish with them. So obviously, I, I, I reconnected with them. And at that time, uh, the University of Manchester was undergoing a certain degree of organization, um, and uh, they found it necessary to disestablish uh, their group uh, working in applied archaeology in Greater Manchester. Um, we seized the opportunity here at the University of Salford and established our Centre for Applied Archaeology, which Mike Neville, who's worked hard with Nigel to put this conference together, uh, uh, leads. And um, um, I recuse myself completely from that discussion in the university because it wouldn't have been appropriate. Uh, some quite sort of steely-eyed people had a look at the viability, came up with the uh, conclusion that it really was worth giving it a go. And um, since then, in fact, um, applied archaeology has really gone from strength to strength at the University of Salford, uh, and including most recently uh, the Dig Manchester program, which uh, will in fact be important across the whole of Greater Manchester. So I'm very proud of the group and what they've achieved over the past couple of years, and this conference is part of it. Um, it's also a unique coming together with Nigel's research centre, because uh, the study of telecommunications, again, uh, has a deep history at the University of Salford, and is something that we're particularly uh, proud of. Um, and Nigel provides great leadership uh, with that group. Uh, and as a person who's always been conscious of the importance of general uh, communication around these sorts of issues, and does a great deal of work, for instance, with the Museum of Science and Industry uh, in Manchester uh, on really uh, working in this really important field. And for him, of course, this has been a rapidly changing field and one that is, is changing all of the time. So there's a, there's a really interesting coming together here of two disciplinary strands to create uh, this uh, conference today. And apart from what will obviously be uh, uh, some very interesting presentations, you will see coming out of this uh, in due course a publication. I'm sure Nigel or Mike will have something to say about that later on. So we're, we're, we're creating uh, an important little sector of research knowledge here in, in coming together to discuss uh, these sorts of issues. I'd like also to uh, really acknowledge uh, the sponsors uh, for today, and you see them up here uh, on, 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 on the slide, and, and, and really thanks to all of them and to their representatives who are here today. Without that sort of sponsorship, we can't put together these sorts of conferences. Um, but uh, they're an interesting bunch of sponsors. Archaeologists, uh, I think, um, have um, a natural suspicion uh, of organizations such as BT uh, and Talk Talk. Uh, and people like Pennine Telecommunications. Uh, and we're learning basically to get to know you because of course, one of the fundamental problems of the digital age is it could potentially do archeologists out of business um, because we do rather depend traditionally on material things that are left behind under the ground. And if all that we're gonna get uh, is some uh, uh, dark fiber with some hint of some digital traffic, um, future archaeologists uh, might not have a great deal to dig up because is it really going to be interesting to dig up a bunch of dark fibre and manholes? Um, 
So we're kind of getting used to the idea of the digital world because as archaeologists we work with very tangible things. So again, the sorts of conversations here are really interesting because the nature of the material world around us, which we work with as archaeologists, is really changing in quite an alarming way that I think we're not spending enough time to contemplate. We are not leaving uh, material possessions behind us. If we don't leave material possessions behind us, we lose, in my opinion, uh, some of the richness of the fabric of the cities and the places that we live. And for me, coming to Manchester has been a wonderful opportunity because as soon as you get an archaeological eye, if you like, not necessarily because you're a professional archaeologist, but because, in fact, you like the idea, and you start looking at the city around you, and you just start walking around any area of Manchester or Salford, you realize that there's all sorts of little things in that environment that make up the richness of that environment. So it can be a manhole cover. It can be one of those plaques on the side of bridges that everybody put up when they opened them 100 years ago. Um, it can be little bits left over from previous industrial cities. I find it almost impossible to drive across the Pennines without stopping the car every five minutes because you're actually driving across a completely man-made environment. Now, one of the slightly alarming concepts about the digital world is how much of that is going to be left behind for the archaeologists of the future to excavate. So I think it's really important that Mike uh, talks to Nigel uh, because if Mike doesn't talk to Nigel and if archaeology doesn't understand what's going to happen in the digital future, uh, our successor archaeologists are going to curse us because there's not going to be anything to dig up. Um, <laughs> thinking a little bit about archaeology, of course, um, archaeology almost is communication in a fundamental way. And although the, the topic today is overwhelmingly on industrial archaeology, so the papers that we're going to hear are really about our industrial past coming through to the present, because there was anything's archaeology if it happened five minutes ago, um, so although your focus is on industrial archaeology, in quite an important way, communication defines, or concepts of communication, are our definitions of what it means to be human. And if this was a, if this was a conference on Paleolithic archaeology, or we were debating, for instance, uh, the latest discovery of Australopithecines, or the earliest remains from our own genus Homo, uh, we would be having quite intense discussions about what separates us uh, from our lineage uh, in the great apes. And we would be hearing arguments that you can no longer make those definitions and distinctions in terms of physical characteristics, uh, but we would be hearing arguments that it's evidence for language and evidence for communication that actually defines what humanity is and defines that breakpoint. And this is still a remarkably unknown and debated area uh, in that particular field of archaeology. Um, one of the more convincing uh, definitions that I have is it's the combination of language and the ability to conceptualize the abstract. So some of the most telling uh, definitions of the origins of humanity are where we begin to find evidence, for example, for the deliberate burial of the dead. Uh, because you do not deliberately bury somebody unless you have a concept of time that extends beyond life experience, because otherwise you would just do something for the sake of hygiene. Now, these are issues that are intensely debated about archaeologists, but in a way what they do is they put the question of communication right at the heart of the definition of what archaeology is and what the definition of we are, because if we couldn't communicate, we wouldn't be human. Um, and so although this is pretty industrial, the, the topic goes to the philosophical heart, if you like, of what, of what, of what we are and what archaeology is as a discipline. Concentrating now on that industrial piece, in other words, where we are today, it's of course singularly appropriate that we should be having this conference in this year, and I see very appropriately from the conference pack uh, the focus on the Bridgewater Canal. It's the 250th anniversary of the Bridgewater Canal. I don't have to tell most of you that, you will know that. Uh, you'll also know, of course, that the Bridgewater is the world's first true canal in the sense that it that it, that it, that it, that it canalized, uh, 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 wasn't just really shoring up the banks of a river, so to speak. And um, as, as I'm sure many of you do, I really enjoy uh, walking on the Bridgewater Canal. In fact, I did so early this morning, do so most weekends. And what's quite remarkable about that, of course, and you still look back at 250 years of technology, is the ability uh, to make uh, the water of the canal flow over a river. And if you look back to the sort of instrumentation that was available 250 years ago, that is quite a remarkable achievement. Now, 
again, the Bridgewater Canal and the canal system is all about communication. And, and the thing that always stays in my mind about the Bridgewater Canal is that the day after uh, the Bridgewater Canal opened, the price of coal in Manchester halved, transformed the Manchester economy overnight. Because, of course, before that, uh, all the coal had been brought from places like Worsley. Most people who live in Worsley don't remember these days that they live in a coal mine. Um, <laughs> but basically brought coal from Worsley to Manchester on the back of mules and donkeys, rather than on the back uh, of the, uh, on, on the barges of the canal. So again, that was about communication. And the, um, the whole canal system in Manchester can really be seen as a communication system. So it's doubly appropriate that we should be having uh, our conference here. Uh, and also that uh, we should be having it literally um, uh, on the uh, margins of the Manchester Ship Canal and in the heart of Manchester's really great canal system. Um, my view is that the, uh, that, that, uh, the uh, Manchester Canal system should be a World Heritage Site. This is a contentious issue. Um, and I'm really hoping that Mike and his colleagues demonstrate the case for that, particularly in the Dig Manchester, uh, Dig Manchester uh, project. All of you, I would expect you, to, uh, to write to the newspapers and urge that, Manchester, that the Manchester Canal system becomes a World Heritage Site. It certainly deserves to be recognized as one. So here we are then in, 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 in Manchester at the 250th anniversary um, of uh, the Bridgewater Canal. We're surrounded by the archaeology of communications, whether it's the canal system, whether it's the road system, whether it's our motorway systems. These are all nice tangible things. We can have an archaeology of motorways, and believe me, we already have one. Uh, so in other conferences uh, around the country, you will be delighted to know we have papers on the archaeology of the M6 um, uh, and other such topics. And we are getting to the point uh, where some of those bridges of the first expansion uh, of, the, um, of uh, the motorway system in the 1960s are turning into archaeological sites. I'm old enough to remember what it was like to, draw, to drive from one part of the country to the other without the motorway system. Uh, and believe me, it took a very long time. Um, so we, 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 we are surrounded by road systems, we're surrounded by motorway systems, we're surrounded by, and this comes very much into the telecommunications area, uh, the physical remnants of earlier telecommunication systems around us. And we now have this extraordinary new world of digital communication as we get these uh, extraordinary networks um, of sometimes tangible uh, fiber connections, but increasingly uh, less tangible uh, connections in telecommunication systems around us, which are changing the way uh, we work and the way, way we live and the way we understand life. And these are all things that are very relevant uh, to our understanding of, the, of our archaeology of the present and what will become the archaeology of the future. So it's a present pleasure, pleasure to welcome you all. As always in my situation, I've got another engagement later this morning, so I'm going to be able to listen to a couple of the papers, uh, but I'm going to have to slip away uh, later on uh, in, 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 in the course of the morning. But I do thank you all for coming. I know it's going to be a fascinating day. And um, I would imagine I probably now hand over to Nigel. <laughs>